You're listening ad-free on Amazon Music. 28-year-old Heather Bogle had just been through a couple of really hard weeks. And now, as the single mother looked up at the huge factory where she was about to spend the entire night building washing machines, she still just could not put the events of the past month out of her mind. It was April 9th, 2015, and Heather was standing next to her old car out in the parking lot of the largest employer in the tiny town of Clyde, Ohio, population 6,000. Directly in front of her was the entryway into Whirlpool Incorporated, a sprawling white metal and brick complex with a total workforce of 3,500 people. And once Heather clicked her way through that metal turnstile and entered the factory, she'd be walking out of the cool, clear, quiet evening darkness into an echo chamber the size of more than 30 football fields, all filled with sound and light and people wearing green foam earplugs and safety glasses. Heather had been working the night shift here for two years, and the steady paycheck and health benefits she received had made it possible for her and her six-year-old daughter, Mackenzie, to afford a pretty good life in the town of Fremont, nine miles north of Clyde. But, important as this job was to Heather, the young mom did not plan to spend the rest of her life working on a production line. Over the last few years, Heather had split her daylight hours between taking care of Mackenzie, catching up on sleep, and also going to school so she could achieve her real ambition, which was to become a licensed practical nurse. Now, Heather forced herself not to look down at her phone and reread the horrible text messages her older half-brother had sent her when Heather had recently gotten word that she'd failed one of her Ohio State Board nursing exams. But the real problem was, Heather didn't have to read those texts to hear them bouncing around in her head. Joshua had called her a dumb hoe who was too stupid to pass the licensed practical nurse exam. He'd signed off by accusing her of having low expectations and then describing her as, quote, typical trash like her mom and dad, end quote. And almost as bad as the pain those words caused was the fact that Heather had just broken up with the one person she could have turned to in this kind of situation for support and comfort. That person was Heather's ex-girlfriend, Carmela Badia. Carmela had been Heather's first relationship with a woman, and their two-year-long romance had been intense for both of them. Before Carmela, Heather's longest relationship had been with Mackenzie's dad. Heather and Richard had met when Heather was 18, and even though they had never married, the two had moved in together right away and then ended their relationship five years later. Unlike Heather's breakup with Carmela, Heather's split from Richard had been a mutual decision. There wasn't much drama, Heather wanted to be free, and so did Richard. After that, when Heather and Mackenzie had moved to their house in Fremont, Heather was so busy and so focused on school and her daughter that she wasn't actively looking to date anyone. And when Heather first met Carmela at Whirlpool, Heather thought of Carmela only as someone she hit it off with and whose day shift overlapped just enough with Heather's night shift that the two of them would eventually strike up a friendship. But right from the start, Carmela had been open about her crush on Heather. At first, Heather had laughed about Carmela's good-natured flirting, but over the course of a few months, Heather's feelings for Carmela had deepened. But the stress of working opposite shifts and the differences in their personalities, along with mutual feelings of jealousy, ultimately took their toll. And in March, less than one month earlier, the relationship had ended in a storm of arguments, accusations, and bitter phone calls and text messages. Just the day before, Heather and Carmela had had one of their worst arguments yet, and Carmela had written Heather a long, angry letter that was now sitting in the front passenger seat of Heather's 2003 Oldsmobile Alero car. As Heather locked up her dark green sedan before taking her first step towards the blue awning that read Whirlpool, Clyde Operations, Carmela's words also sounded inside of Heather's head. You duped me, Carmela had scrawled in ballpoint pen on the small lined pages. You have no idea how bad you hurt me. You're dead to me. A few minutes later, as Heather pushed her way through the metal roundabout before walking into the factory, all she could hope was that the next eight hours would be so loud and distracting that the only thing she'd hear was the sound of metal and plastic appliance parts snapping into place. As a materials handler, Heather's own job took her to various parts of the factory. Using small vehicles called forklifts and tuggers, she was tasked with driving through the miles of factory space, collecting parts, and then delivering those parts to her fellow workers on the assembly line. 
But even in a workplace where 30 miles of conveyors clanked and rattled overhead and where workers had to pay attention to what they were doing, Heather's friends on the production line they all shared couldn't help but notice that instead of her usual smile, Heather looked upset. And as Heather shoved the foam plugs into her ears and slipped on her safety glasses before stepping in behind the wheel of her tugger, she saw the looks of concern aimed in her direction. Checking over her shoulder to make sure that the little tow cart behind her tugger was securely attached before starting up the vehicle's engine, Heather found her spirits lifting just a little. She might not be able to confide about her recent disappointments to Carmela, but she reminded herself that she still had plenty of friends at work. People who were rooting for her to pick herself back up, to take that nursing exam again, and not give up on her dream of a better life for herself and Mackenzie. And between conversations with her friends over the course of the night, Heather didn't have to reply to any text message or incoming phone calls unless she felt like it. All the important parts of her day were already totally planned out, and everyone who played a part in her daily routine already knew exactly where and when they could find Heather if they really needed to. And it had been that way for more than a year. Heather's shift always ended just after 6 in the morning, and after clocking out, Heather would call Mackenzie's babysitter before Mackenzie headed off to school. Then Heather would head for her home in Fremont to sleep until it was time to collect Mackenzie at the end of the school day. After that, Heather could enjoy spending the afternoon and evening with her daughter before dropping Mackenzie back off with the sitter and leaving for work just before 10 p.m. Even now, when Heather was feeling down, just the thought of her daughter made her smile. Tomorrow's forecast called for cool weather and wind, but it was also supposed to be nice and sunny, and so if Heather made sure to bring along an extra warm jacket for Mackenzie to wear after school, the two of them could spend some time outside on the playground. Being out with Mackenzie was usually the best part of Heather's day, and Heather liked knowing that when people saw the two of them together, there was no mistaking them for anything other than mother and child. With her blonde hair and big smile, Mackenzie looked like a younger version of her slender mom, with the brown eyes, shoulder-length hair, and a scattering of freckles across a tan face. By the time Heather had begun her first circuit of the bright warehouse that night, the third shift had settled in for that night's work. Over the next 24 hours, the Whirlpool factory would turn out a total of 20,000 washing machines. And tonight, as Heather waved to her co-workers, being one of the team that produced those washing machines made her feel better. She might not be here for the next 30 years, but she knew she was lucky to have this job and have co-workers whose lives were a lot like her own. Other parents raising kids just like she was, people with worries just like she had. And by the time morning rolled around and Heather was throwing away her foam earplugs and pulling off her safety glasses, her usual smile was back on her face. Chatting with coworkers over the last eight hours had been good. The sympathetic responses she had gotten had helped put Heather back into her naturally optimistic state of mind. She knew that once she saved up enough money to take the state nursing exam again, she would make sure that she passed it. Now, as Heather looked up at the clock and shook her hair out of its ponytail, the disappointments and hurts of the last few days didn't seem nearly as crushing to her as they had the night before. She knew her mom had sent her at least a few text messages, but Heather decided she would answer those later. For now, she had one more thing she had to do before she went home to sleep, and it shouldn't take long. Heather would wait to call her mom and babysitter once she had arrived back at her house in Fremont. A few minutes later, and Heather was pushing through the metal turnstile under the blue Whirlpool awning, hands in her pockets and head down as she stepped out into the parking lot and headed for her car. It wasn't until 2.33 p.m. that afternoon, eight and a half hours after Heather's night shift had ended, that Heather's mother really started to get worried. That's when Renee McLaughlin sent yet another text to her daughter, asking if Heather was still planning to pick up Mackenzie after school. Renee might not even have bothered to send this text, since Heather always picked her daughter up after school, but earlier messages that Renee had sent to Heather while Heather was at work had all gone unanswered, and that wasn't like her daughter. Now, as Renee looked at her phone, waiting for Heather to text her back, Renee had to make a conscious effort to relax. Renee was still checking for Heather's reply when Renee got a phone call from another one of her daughters, Heather's younger sister, Jen. And as Renee listened to Jen explain what was going on, the worry Renee had been feeling tightened into a huge knot of fear. Now she knew for sure something was very, very wrong. 
It turned out that Jen, who was listed as Heather's emergency contact, had just been notified by Mackenzie's school that Heather had never arrived that afternoon to pick Mackenzie up. Jen also discovered that in another break from Heather's usual routine, Heather had not called Mackenzie's babysitter that morning before the babysitter had taken Mackenzie into school. After filling her mom in on the situation, Jen had hopped into her car and headed for Mackenzie's school. On her way, Jen used the short trip to call Heather's friends to see if any of them had heard from Heather that day. Meanwhile, Renee got on her phone and began calling other family members, including one of Heather's cousins who also worked at Whirlpool to see if any of them had seen or heard from Heather. As soon as Jen had returned from school and dropped Mackenzie off with Renee, Jen and one of Heather's best friends began their own search for Heather. They printed out flyers with Heather's picture on them to put on telephone poles. They jumped on Facebook and other social media sites to spread the word about Heather's disappearance. Then the two women drove and walked around Fremont and Clyde, splitting up so they could cover more ground, stopping at Heather's grandfather's house before hitting every store or park or playground that Heather liked to visit. They also called hospitals, tow truck companies, and more friends. By 5.30 p.m., after arranging care for Mackenzie, Renee walked into the Sandusky County Sheriff's Department, 30 miles northeast of Fremont, and filed a missing person report on her daughter. The violent crime rate in Clyde, Ohio is among the lowest in the state. So any circumstance in which someone's life might be in danger was taken seriously right away. There was no 24 hour grace period or anything like that. Instead, it was instant action. And after hearing the pure panic in Renee's description of how out of character it would be for Heather not to pick up her daughter after school, the situation seemed unusual and suspicious enough that the sheriff's department acted immediately. Even as Jen and her friend were crisscrossing town searching for Heather, the sheriff's office issued an alert to local hospitals and other law enforcement agencies, as well as to the local news media. And before long, officers were driving over to the Whirlpool factory parking lot and surrounding area to search for Heather's car. The deputies also stopped at local bars and went to the home in a nearby trailer park to talk with Heather's ex and Mackenzie's dad, Richard. But it wasn't until 8 p.m. that evening, 40 minutes before darkness fell, that police got their first real news on the whereabouts of Heather Bogle. Without giving her name, a woman called police to report that she'd seen a car matching the description of Heather's older model dark green Oldsmobile sedan. And when police ran the license number that the caller gave them, they knew they had a match. A few minutes later, the first deputy on the scene called back to headquarters. He'd found the car where the caller had said it would be. It was in a parking lot that belonged to the Somerton Apartments on Hickory Street in Clyde, just a five minute drive from the Whirlpool factory where Heather worked. But any hope police had that they would find Heather asleep inside of her car or inside one of the apartments visiting a friend quickly vanished. The car was empty except for a black and white striped knapsack and what looked like a personal letter, both sitting on the front passenger seat. And when the deputy forced open the trunk of Heather's car, disappointment and worry suddenly turned to shock and horror. Inside the trunk was the body of a young woman. She lay curled on her side, dressed in jeans, pink and white sneakers, and an oversized red Mickey Mouse t-shirt that hid the two bullet holes in the back of her chest. The victim's knees were drawn up to her chest and her hands were tucked under her chin. Even in the small beam of the flashlight, the deputy could see that this woman had also been savagely beaten. There was also no doubt that she was dead. And it wasn't just the injuries to nearly every visible inch of her body that shocked the veteran police officer. It was the fact that her hair had been crudely hacked off in chunks right down to her scalp. And as the deputy moved the light so it shined down on her hands and face, he saw that her fingernails had also been cut brutally short right down to the soft flesh of the nail bed. Even before the family identified the body, the Sandusky Sheriff's Department knew that they had just found Heather Bogle. By the time Detective Sean O'Connell arrived at the Somerton apartment complex, the area around Heather's car had been marked off as a crime scene. The red paint on the front side panel of Heather's Oldsmobile, the result of bodywork to the car, was the only color picked up by the portable floodlights. 
But the detective, a veteran law enforcement officer with more than 20 years of service, hardly registered the yellow crime scene tape or the sounds and lights of emergency vehicles that were now starting to pour into the 230 block of Hickory Street. Staring down into the trunk of the car and slowly taking in the sight of what had been done to Heather's hair and nails, as well as to her body, the investigator's first thought was this murder was personal. Whoever had beaten Heather and then chopped off her hair must have been acting out of rage. The detective had already been told about a breakup letter from Heather's ex-girlfriend, Carmela, that had been left sitting on the front seat of Heather's car. And even without reading it, Detective O'Connell knew that Carmela was already high up on his list of people of interest. But at the same time, this looked like a crime of passion. There were also obvious signs that the killer had gone to great lengths to erase any evidence that might help police in this homicide investigation. Even before Heather's body was carefully removed from the floor of the trunk and taken to the county morgue for an autopsy to determine exact cause of death and to collect additional physical evidence, there was no visible sign that this car was the place where Heather had actually been murdered. There was no sign of a struggle, there was no sign of a weapon or bullet shell casings, and inside the well of the trunk, the jumper cables, a single white flip-flop, a spare pair of shoes, and a tangle of bungee cords next to a white plastic shopping bag from a Walmart store all appeared undisturbed. Instead, it looked to Detective O'Connell like Heather must have been murdered somewhere else and then dumped here. That way, police would not have an actual murder scene to investigate. There were other signs that the murderer had taken pains to cover their tracks. The neon green top that Heather had been reported wearing when she went missing had been replaced by the extra large red Mickey Mouse shirt. The defensive wounds on Heather's hands, arms, and face all told police that Heather had fought back hard against her attacker, so the killer had cut her nails and her hair in an effort to remove any trace of the killer's DNA that may have transferred to Heather's body in the course of that struggle. After that, it looked like the killer had arranged Heather's body into this fetal position inside the trunk of her car before leaving the vehicle and Heather's body in this poorly lit parking lot outside the cheaply built two-story apartment complex. Crime scene techs would later confirm Detective O'Connell's initial impression of the crime scene. Despite a careful examination of the trunk interior, they found no usable forensic evidence and a later autopsy report would estimate that Heather had been murdered much earlier in the day, probably within a few hours of the Whirlpool video surveillance tape that would show Heather leaving the Whirlpool factory at 6.17 a.m. that morning of Friday, April 10th. That same autopsy would also reveal that Heather had ultimately been killed by two gunshot wounds to her back. But in a huge break for law enforcement, despite the killer's effort to erase any connection to the crime, the medical examiner would find small amounts of what police assumed was the killer's DNA buried under what little remained of Heather's fingernails. When Detective O'Connell finally looked up from his own visual inspection of Heather's body curled up in the trunk of her car, he noticed one of the residents of the 48-unit complex in front of him standing outside her apartment door watching the police do their work. That person was 24-year-old Kiona Bohr, an African-American woman raising two children on her own who had already had at least one run-in with the Sandusky Sheriff's Department's all-white detective bureau. After making sure the crime scene had been properly secured and processed, Detective O'Connell gave orders for police to start canvassing the area for information about the driver of the green car. He also set in motion interviews with personnel at Whirlpool, as well as with Heather's family and friends. Meanwhile, after taking a final look down at the police activity in her parking lot, Kiona stepped back into her apartment, then carefully closed and locked the door behind her. Over the next two weeks, Detective O'Connell reported to the local media and to Heather's family that the Sheriff's Department was making good progress on their investigation into Heather's murder. While he was not ready to make any arrests, the lead detective said investigators had ruled out several key suspects who had close ties to Heather. Although she was among the first to be interviewed as a person of interest, Detective O'Connell quickly checked Carmela Badia off his suspect list. 
As far as he was concerned, Carmela, who had clocked into the Whirlpool factory for her day shift just half an hour after Heather was seen leaving the factory, just didn't have enough time to commit this murder. He also did not believe Carmela would have tried to cover her tracks, but still leave that breakup letter she had written to Heather in the front seat of Heather's car. Also in the clear were Heather's ex-boyfriend, Richard, and Heather's older brother, Joshua. In addition to having an alibi for the time of the murder, Joshua explained to police that the degrading texts he had sent his half-sister shortly before her death were just his way of motivating Heather to do better on her nursing boards next time she took them. He described his insults as being, quote, tough love. But almost from the start of the investigation into Heather's death, it would turn out that Detective O'Connell had formed a theory of the crime that would lead him from one dead end to another. When toxicology tests on Heather's body eventually revealed a small amount of marijuana in her bloodstream, Detective O'Connell became totally convinced that Heather's murder was drug-related, and that Heather's murderer or murderers were all connected to the young African-American woman who had stood outside of her apartment watching police work the crime scene on the night of April 10th when Heather's body was first discovered. Detective O'Connell's suspicions were based on his theory that Heather had driven to the apartment complex after work in order to purchase drugs. And years earlier, Detective O'Connell had arrested the father of one of Keona Boer's children, a man named Omar Satchel, on drug charges. Police had also been informed that before Heather's murder, Kiona had been seen wearing a large-sized red Mickey Mouse shirt that might match the shirt Heather was wearing when her body was discovered, and that there was still a close association between Kiona and Omar. By April 17th, one week after Heather was murdered, police had conducted two searches of Kiona Boer's unit at the Somerton apartment complex. Police had also arrived in force and with guns drawn at the nursing home where Kiona worked to obtain a DNA sample. Even as other tips and potential leads in the case trickled in to the sheriff's office, Detective O'Connell continued to focus his effort on building a case against Kiona Bohr, Omar Satchel, and a third African-American man who the investigators suspected of owning the gun that was used to kill Heather. Meanwhile, Heather's family and friends held a series of vigils in her honor and started raising money that would go to Heather's daughter, Mackenzie. But as the investigation into Heather's death dragged on for more than 12 months without any arrests or hard evidence against Detective O'Connell's chief suspects, Heather's sister, Jen, was not the only person complaining to the media and the sheriff that Detective O'Connell was mishandling the murder investigation. And then, in September 2016, 17 months after Heather's murder, Detective O'Connell announced that he was resigning from the Sandusky Sheriff's Department to take a job as a manager of a McDonald's fast food restaurant. Sean O'Connell's decision came several months after his prime suspects had all broken their silence, not only claiming that they had nothing to do with Heather's murder, but also pointing out that they had never even met Heather and had no personal ties to her whatsoever. To prove their claim, the suspects volunteered tissue and DNA samples, they stated their willingness to take lie detector tests, and pointed to the alibis they had provided police. They also accused the sheriff's department of racial profiling, which is targeting individuals for suspicion of crime based on the individual's race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin. Just before his resignation, Detective O'Connell himself had been placed on three months of paid leave, and the murder investigation had been turned over to the Ohio Bureau of Investigation. And at the same time, Kyle Overmeyer, Sandusky sheriff and Detective O'Connell's boss, admitted to opiate addiction and was charged with stealing prescription drugs from lockboxes at area police stations. Stunned, Heather's family and friends watched as the state stepped in and tried to pick up the pieces of the murder investigation. To them, and to the frightened residents of Clyde and Fremont, it looked like a bungled investigation by a corrupt and possibly racist sheriff's office would result in one of the most vicious murders ever committed in Northwest Ohio turning into a cold case. In November of 2016, 19 months after Heather Bogle's murder, the voters of Sandusky County voted in a brand new sheriff. 
And when police lieutenant Chris Hilton stepped into that office two months later in January of 2017, one of his first moves as sheriff was to appoint a new detective who would be charged with starting the Heather Bogle murder investigation all over again from scratch. And that new detective, Nick Kotsopoulos, did not waste any time following those orders. With 18 years experience in law enforcement, this would be the 11th homicide that Detective Kotsopoulos had investigated. And even though he was basically treating Heather's murder as a cold case, the detective was coming at the homicide from a different direction than former investigator Sean O'Connell. He would follow the hard evidence wherever it took him, but he was also interested in talking with people and potential suspects who had a personal connection to Heather. He also wanted to find out exactly where Heather was killed. And after going through the complete file on Heather's murder, it didn't take long for the new lead investigator to totally rule out Sean O'Connell's top three suspects. Not only was there absolutely no physical evidence to connect them to Heather's death, it turned out none of their DNA matched the tissue sample that the medical examiner had found under Heather's nails, an important detail that former Detective O'Connell had left out of his reports on the case. Those DNA results would also rule out, once and for all, Heather's ex-girlfriend, Carmela, and Heather's half-brother, Joshua. Once he had cleared all the past suspects in Heather's murder, the new investigator went back through the tips that former Detective O'Connell had received from Heather's co-workers, but never followed up on. The investigator also found several search warrants related to collecting possible evidence in Heather's death that former Detective O'Connell had not executed. Those warrants included one that allowed the investigator access to Heather's computer and to all the location data collected from Heather's devices, including her phone, that was collected and stored in her various Google applications. Designed by the technology giant Google, those applications included Heather's email account, as well as a social connection program called Google Hangouts that allowed the user to send their GPS location to their contacts. In order to do that, Google Hangouts used Heather's phone to track her real-life location. Heather's records showed that the last ping from Heather's cell phone before the battery died came in at 9.20 a.m. on April 10th, 2015, three hours after Heather was last seen on that security footage that showed her leaving the Whirlpool parking lot at 6.17 on the morning she disappeared. Using Heather's cell phone records, investigators were able to narrow her whereabouts between 6.17 a.m. and 9.20 a.m., but they could only place her location during those critical hours within a radius of about five miles from the cell phone tower. So it wasn't until the investigator overlaid that data with the GPS coordinates of Heather's cell phone that had been collected by her various Google accounts, all of which Heather had left open, that Detective Kotsopoulos finally hit pay dirt. A map of all those GPS coordinates allowed investigators to pinpoint with much greater accuracy the location of Heather's cell phone on the morning that she went missing. On May 26, 2017, just over two years after Heather's murder, Detective Kotsopoulos and his investigation team left the Sandusky Sheriff's Department and made the 40 minutes drive south to a place called Emerald Estates Trailer Park located in Green Creek Township. Their destination was a white trailer located at the bottom point of an important triangle. The home with the wooden porch built off the side was located 13 minutes and six miles southwest of the Whirlpool factory in Clyde where Heather had worked and nine miles and 17 minutes southeast of Fremont where Heather had lived with her little daughter Mackenzie. When police arrived at trailer number 79, the resident and owner of the trailer looked surprised to see them, but invited them to come inside. Yes, this person told Detective Kotsopoulos, they'd be more than happy to answer any questions about Heather Bogle, even though the person had hardly known her. It wasn't until the owner of trailer number 79 refused to volunteer a DNA sample that Detective Kotsopoulos felt the adrenaline surge through his body he was suddenly sure that the 25-month-long search for Heather's killer was finally over. Based on evidence that Detective Kotsopoulos and his team would collect over the next few days, here is a reconstruction of what police believe really happened to 28-year-old Heather Bogle after she left work more than two years earlier on Friday, April 10th, 2015 at 6.17 in the morning. 
Heather's killer had an eye for vulnerable women. He also had an eye for attractive women who played up their femininity. He liked painted fingernails, and he liked that Heather had that nose piercing and wore that sparkling stud that brought out her brown eyes. He liked that she didn't eat Doritos with her fingers because she didn't want to get the red seasoning from the corn chips all over her hands. But on the night of April 9th, when Heather arrived at work without her usual smile and with stress written all over her face, what Heather's killer liked most of all was the fact that Heather was so obviously upset. And when their paths crossed at work that night on the manufacturing line, as they had every night for more than a year, Heather's killer made it a point to find out exactly what was bothering his popular and trusting young coworker. Over the next eight hours, Heather's killer gathered up each crumb of information, receiving each one with a look of sympathy, how Heather had failed one of her nursing exams, how her own brother had just sent her text messages calling her too stupid to pass, how she would have to go back to studying for the tests all over again and save up the hundreds of dollars it would cost her to retake the state exams. And by the time Heather's night shift was over, Heather's killer had persuaded her to stop by his house after work. He was pretty sure he had some books on human anatomy and biology that might help with Heather's next round of study. He told her where he lived and how easy it was to get there. So after leaving the Whirlpool factory parking lot at 6.17 a.m., Heather hopped into her dark green car with the bright red front side panel and began the short drive to Emerald Estates trailer park. There was no need to call her mom or babysitter. Heather expected this visit would be a short one. And if it delayed her at all, it would only be for a few minutes. She could return her mom's text messages and call the sitter on her drive back to Fremont. When Heather pulled up outside of the white trailer marked number 79, Heather saw her coworker's car in the driveway. So after parking her Alero, she hopped out and walked up the four wooden steps leading to the covered porch and knocked on the front door of the trailer. Heather only had to wait a second before the door was open. And with a smile of thanks, Heather stepped inside. As soon as the killer had closed the door behind his visitor, he didn't waste any time on any more conversation with Heather about her recent setbacks. He also did not have any study guides that would help her pass her next round of exams. Instead of collecting nursing textbooks, Heather's killer was a man who had spent a lot of time building a home video library that showcased his taste for violent sex and for non-consensual bondage and domination. And what he wanted now, very badly, was to have sex with Heather. But instead of accepting his advances, welcoming the way he leaned into her, getting too close and reaching out to pull her towards him, Heather was confused and repelled, saying no to his advances and then pushing him away. The man in front of her was 46 years old, that was 18 years older than she was, and Heather's last relationship had been with a woman. But even as the creepiness and then danger of the situation fully registered with Heather, it was too late. Because now, the man in front of her was both enraged and excited by Heather's rejection. In that moment, the killer's need to have sex with Heather, an act that might leave traces of his DNA inside of her, had changed to something else. An overwhelming desire to control and punish her. But Heather was a fighter. And despite the fact that she was hopelessly outweighed and overpowered by her much larger and stronger attacker, Heather responded to the assault by hitting her killer so hard that she broke one of his teeth and cracked another. But over the course of that morning, Heather would pay for her bravery. The autopsy on her body that would be performed the next day would include a long catalog of injuries to all parts of Heather's body. Ligature marks on her wrists and ankles showed that she had been tied up. There were also curved red lines on the left side of her neck where she may have been whipped with a cord or had the cord wrapped around her throat. Heather's face, jaw, eyelids, forehead, and legs were covered with bruises, and even her tongue showed signs of bite marks and lacerations. Her hands and arms were dotted with round red defensive wounds caused by blunt trauma. And when the killer was finished with his savage torture and beating, he left her on the floor and then came back with his 380 Cobra small caliber handgun and fired two shots into Heather's back, injuries that collapsed her lungs and caused almost immediate death. But even though Heather's resistance had enraged her killer, it was that decision to fight for her life that would eventually help police identify her killer. 
Before arranging Heather's lifeless body in the trunk of her green car, the killer pulled off her green neon top and replaced it with an extra large red Mickey Mouse t-shirt. And then, in what police believe was an effort to destroy any physical evidence that could tie him to the murder, the killer also hacked Heather's shoulder length hair off at the roots and cut her fingernails down to the quick. But Heather had fought so hard that traces of her attacker's DNA had been pushed underneath the cuticles that covered the bottom of her fingernails. It would be just enough to give police the tissue sample they would later use to help convict her killer. After abandoning Heather's car, with Heather's body locked in the trunk, at the Somerton apartment complex, the killer sat back to wait and to build his cover of innocence. He made sure that he went to Heather's funeral and signed the guest register, expressing his grief alongside so many of Heather's other co-workers from Whirlpool. He also pulled up and replaced the flooring in his trailer, where police believe Heather had been shot and killed. And when Heather's family set up a GoFundMe page for Heather's daughter, Mackenzie, 44-year-old Daniel Myers, a 17-year veteran of Whirlpool, who had worked right alongside Heather on the factory's production and material handling lines, made a donation of $125. On that same GoFundMe page, Daniel, who had been arrested on a domestic assault charge in 2001 and another assault charge in 2004, posted this message, quote, Heather, you were such an amazing person. I am distraught that there will be no more of your smiles at work. You will always be in my thoughts. Your daughter will always be in my prayers. God bless you, little Missy, end quote. It would turn out that on May 26th, when Detective Nick Kotsopoulos and his team headed to trailer number 79 in Emerald Estates Trailer Park, they were following the location coordinates they had found stored in Heather's Google accounts. It had been an electronic trail, there ever since the day of Heather's murder, that followed the young mother from the Whirlpool factory in Clyde on the morning of April 10th, 2015, to the actual scene of her murder. And during that first interview with Detective Kotsopoulos, when Daniel Myers told police he hardly knew Heather and then refused to volunteer a DNA sample, the investigator knew right away that he had a brand new prime suspect in the murder of Heather Bogle. As for Daniel Myers' broken tooth, he told investigators it was nothing and that he'd fixed it himself using superglue. In the days immediately following that first interview with Daniel Myers at trailer number 79, investigators were able to get a search warrant that compelled him to give police a DNA sample. Police also got a warrant to search his house where they found guns, videotapes of violent sexual encounters, and under the carpet, new sections of flooring that had been installed within a week of Heather's disappearance. On June 1st, after lab tests matched Daniel's DNA to the tissue found under Heather's cuticles, Daniel Myers was arrested and charged with aggravated first-degree murder, robbery, and kidnapping in the death of Heather Bogle. Immediately after Daniel Myers' arrest, 10 women came forward to report that they had been raped by Daniel Myers. But it would turn out that Daniel Myers would not be the only person in the Heather Bogle homicide investigation who would face criminal charges. On December 13th, 2018, a little over a year after Daniel Myers' arrest, former detective Sean O'Connell was sentenced to two years in prison for actions related to his investigation into Heather's murder. Those charges included tampering with and falsifying evidence and sharing confidential murder files with members of the public. It would turn out that former detective O'Connell had pursued his case against Keona Bohr, Omar Satchel, and a third African-American suspect even after he knew that their DNA did not match the DNA found under Heather's fingernails. As a result of being singled out as a murder suspect, Keona Bohr would lose her job and apartment, and she and her school-aged son would both become the target of hate and bullying. Former Detective O'Connell was also criticized for delaying justice. Just days after Heather's murder, Sean O'Connell had received an email tip from a woman who worked at Whirlpool telling police she knew of one employee who she believed, based on her own encounters, would be capable of committing murder. And that man's name was Daniel Myers. Detective O'Connell also failed to execute the search warrant he had early on in the Heather Bogle investigation that would have given him access to the Google accounts that had stored a record of Heather's movements from the time she left work on the day of her murder until her phone died three hours later. 
On February 13th, 2019, almost four years after Heather's death, Heather's co-worker Daniel Myers pleaded guilty to murder in order to avoid the death penalty. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. But before the judge issued that sentence, there was one final twist in a murder case that had generated headlines across the state and that would become the subject of several true crime documentaries. Just days after Daniel Myers was arrested in 2017, investigators reopened an older case involving the death of Myers' ex-girlfriend, 37-year-old Leanne Sluter. Back in 2009, six years before the murder of Heather Bogle, Daniel Myers told police he had discovered Leanne lying dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in the bedroom of a trailer he owned. At the time, police did not question Daniel's account or treat the death as suspicious, even though Leanne's family wanted Daniel questioned as a suspect. Ultimately, the new investigation into Leanne's death turned up a suicide note in the victim's handwriting that was provided by Daniel Meyer's family. But although the Leanne Sluter investigation ended without another charge of murder, Leanne Sluter's family insist that if police had done a thorough investigation into Leanne's death and questioned Daniel Myers as a suspect back in 2009, Heather Bogle would still be alive today. On the morning of February 2nd, 2012, a young man pulled off a four-lane highway in Anchorage, Alaska into a large snowy parking lot. He passed by dozens of parked cars until he arrived in front of the small shack that was brightly teal colored. It was a popular coffee shop called The Common Grounds, and this young man worked as a barista there. After he parked his car, he walked up to the white door employee entrance to this little building, and he got his key out and he went to unlock the door, but when he turned the key, he saw the door was already unlocked. He knew the girl who had worked the previous night and would have been responsible for locking the shop up. She was 18-year-old Samantha Koenig, and although she had only been on the job for about a month, she seemed very responsible and had never had any issues closing up before. The young man shrugged it off though, he figured people make mistakes, and he went inside. Right away, he noticed that a couple of things just seemed out of place. It was like Samantha must have just left in the middle of her shift without even attempting to clean up. There were napkins on the ground, there were towels out, there were cups still out. And so as this young man is walking over to the cash register to unlock it, he's running through scenarios in his head about how Samantha could have been so sloppy. And then he reached down with his register key and just like the door, the cash register was already unlocked. When he pulled the tray out, all the money was gone. And that's when he knew they had been robbed. And so he called his boss. The night before, Samantha had asked her boyfriend, Dwayne, to pick her up after her shift at the Common Grounds. Dwayne arrived in front of the kiosk at about 8.30 p.m., which was 30 minutes after her shift should have been over. Dwayne had gotten held up at his job, which is why he was late. And so when he gets there, Dwayne looks around the parking lot, and he doesn't see Samantha anywhere. He sees the coffee shop itself is totally dark and looks like it's been closed up for the night. And so Dwayne gets out of his truck into the freezing cold night air and he walked up to the window of this coffee shop and he pressed his face up to the glass to look inside, but there was nobody in there. Dwayne automatically went back to the fight he had gotten into with Samantha earlier in the night via text message. She had accused him of cheating on her. He had been kind of nonchalant, like he didn't care about it. And what ensued was a really ugly fight. And so as Dwayne is walking back to his truck, he's thinking to himself, Maybe Samantha just didn't want to see him because of the fight. And so at the end of her shift, she got a ride home from her father or maybe from a friend. And that's why she's not here. And so Dwayne gets back inside of his truck and he sends a text message to Samantha asking if she's okay, if she's gotten home. But after several minutes of no response from her, Dwayne, even though they were fighting, he still cares an awful lot about his girlfriend. He decides, I just, I gotta go by her house and make sure she's there and that she's okay. And so a couple minutes later, he gets to her house. He goes up to the door and her single father, James, answers the door. Dwayne explains that he didn't see Samantha after her shift and just wanted to make sure she was here, but James says, she's not here. I have no idea where she is. I haven't spoken to her. And so the two men go into James's kitchen, they sit down, and they start texting and calling Samantha to try to figure out where she is. And after a couple of minutes, Dwayne's phone lights up and it's a text message from Samantha. And the message clearly indicates that she's still very upset with Dwayne, but she's saying that she needs some time to think and that she's gonna be with some friends for a couple of days and would he, Dwayne, let her father know where she was. And so Dwayne shows James the text message and Samantha's father looks at it and he's thinking to himself, you know, this is very uncharacteristic of Samantha. 
He had raised Samantha since she was two years old and they were very close. They shared everything with each other. It didn't make any sense that she wouldn't contact him directly to say that she was going to be out with friends for a couple of days. And it didn't make sense that she would ignore all of his phone calls and text messages when clearly he was worried about her. The two men stayed up super late calling and texting, hoping to get more information from Samantha, but she never responded, she never texted back. And so the following morning, when neither men had gotten any more messages from Samantha, James went to the Anchorage Police Department and filed a missing person report for his only daughter. After receiving this missing person report, an officer with the Anchorage Police Department called the owner of the Common Grounds coffee shop to ask about Samantha. And the owner actually said they just got a call from their barista that was working at the kiosk that morning and they had informed them that apparently there had been a robbery and no one can get in touch with Samantha. No one knows where she is. The owner told the police officer that as soon as she got her hands on the security footage from the night before, she would send it over to the police department. While the police waited for this footage, some officers began calling Samantha's friends and other family members to see if they knew where she was, but no one had heard from her and no one knew where she was. No one had any information. Some other police officers headed over to the Common Grounds coffee kiosk to get a look at it for themselves. And when they got there, there was no sign of a struggle outside or inside the kiosk. And inside, underneath the counter, was a panic button that had not been pressed. And so even though Samantha's father thought there was something odd about her final text message, the police began operating under the theory that Samantha had robbed the kiosk and then left of her own accord. But what confounded police was how Samantha actually physically got away from the coffee shop. She didn't have a car that night and she couldn't have just walked away because the weather was way too miserable and cold outside and Anchorage is just not really a walkable city. And so if Samantha was telling the truth that she was just taking a couple of days to be by herself with some friends at their place, then why didn't any of her friends know where she was? This question was answered later that day when the owner of the coffee shop made the security footage available. The footage, which has no audio, picks up around 8 p.m. on February 1st, 2012, which was the night Samantha went missing. It shows Samantha inside of the kiosk. She's working alone. She's cheerful and she's busy. And then at some point, someone that we can't see, they're outside of the camera's range, comes up to the window and orders a drink. Samantha clearly turns to them, acknowledges their drink order, and turns and begins making this drink. And then after she's done making it, she turns to give it to this person and immediately Samantha steps back and puts her arms up. And then seconds later, she reaches over and turns off the lights inside of the kiosk. And then she gets down on her knees with her back to the window. She stays in that position, not talking, not moving for about a minute before she slowly stands up and walks down the kiosk towards the cash register. She opens it up, she scoops some money out of it. Then she walks back to the window and appears to hand it to a shadowy figure on the other side of the window. And then Samantha turns, kneels again with her back to the window. Two more minutes go by before this person outside the window leans their entire upper body inside of the coffee shop. They reach down and they appear to tie Samantha's hands. Now, because it was dark inside of the kiosk, the footage winds up being extremely grainy and there's no way to identify who this figure is. Although it's fairly obvious that it's a male, he's wearing a big sweatshirt and he's got a hat pulled down low over his face. After this mystery man is done tying Samantha's hands, he leaps through the window and then shuts the window behind him. And then he stands Samantha up and puts a gun into her back. Then he marches her out the employee door and then out across the lot all the way to a white pickup truck where he puts her inside and they drive off. Over the next couple of days, the police and also the FBI who had been called in to be a part of this investigation, they just kept hitting dead end after dead end because there was no evidence. All they had was the surveillance footage that was too grainy to tell who this guy was that took Samantha. Meanwhile, Samantha's father, James, had rallied the support of nearly all 300,000 people that lived in Anchorage to go out and look for his daughter. His efforts were so profound, it had attracted major news outlets across the country, and suddenly his daughter's story had grabbed national headlines everywhere. This led to strangers donating thousands of dollars to fund a reward for anybody that had information about Samantha's whereabouts. But despite this reward growing in size every single day, and the national news media becoming increasingly more interested in this case, no one came forward with useful information that led to developments in this case. And Samantha never got in touch with Dwayne or her father. Then on February 24th, so three weeks after Samantha's gone missing and no one's heard from her, Dwayne got a text message from Samantha's phone. And it was directing him to a particular sign inside of a nearby public park. And so Dwayne and James read this text, they shared it with the police department, and then they raced to this park and actually beat the police there by about 15 minutes. 
And so Dwayne and James, they walk through the gates and they start walking down this main trail and they stop in front of the sign. It was actually a bulletin board and tacked on the bulletin board was a Ziploc bag inside of which was a typed ransom note. And on the ransom note, literally Xeroxed onto it, was a black and white photo of Samantha. And in this photo, Samantha looks kind of dazed, like she's got a blank expression, and she's not really looking at the camera, she's looking just to the side of the camera. And then in this picture, a man is holding a copy of the Anchorage Daily News newspaper that's dated February 13th, 2012. This was a proof of life photo where Samantha's captor was holding up that newspaper to indicate that Samantha was alive as of February 13th. And so to everybody involved in this case, including Samantha's father, even though this is still not a good situation at all, it was kind of a relief to know that at least as of last week, Samantha was alive. As for the demands of this ransom note, James was told to deposit $30,000 into his daughter's account immediately, and if he did that, she would be released six months later. As advised by the FBI, James deposited a portion of the ransom money into his daughter's account, and then the FBI just waited and watched, because they knew if anyone tried to withdraw money from that account, they could track where the card was. A few days later, three separate withdrawals were made within Anchorage, but each time the FBI got a notification about one of these withdrawals, they would rush to the scene, and whoever it was that had tried to make this withdrawal was long gone. When they pulled the security footage from these three different ATMs, the person that was making these withdrawals was a man wearing a ski mask and big sunglasses, so they had no way to identify him. After these withdrawals, the account went silent for over a week, and in that time, there was no word from Samantha. Then, on March 7th, more withdrawals were made, but they were in Arizona, and then New Mexico, and then in Texas. Again, authorities would rush to these ATMs, but they would get there right after the masked man with sunglasses had just left. But there was a break this time. In one of these surveillance videos from one of the Texas ATMs, they spotted the car this guy was getting into before he left. And it was a small sedan, it was a white Ford Focus, and they saw him leave going east on a Texas highway. And so authorities in Texas were told to look out for this particular car in this part of Texas. And sure enough, on March 13th, a Texas patrolman spotted the car sitting in a hotel parking lot. He waited nearby until a man in his 30s walked out of one of the hotel rooms, walked down, and got inside the car. And then this patrolman just kind of followed him and looked for any reason to pull him over. And as he had his radar gun on this guy, he noticed he was going two miles per hour above the speed limit, and so he pulled him over. The patrolman got out, he walked up to the driver's side window, the window was already down, the man was very calm, the patrolman asked him for his license, and the guy handed him an Alaskan license. His name was Israel Keys. he was 34 years old, and he lived in Anchorage. patrolman knew this was the guy. He called in backup and before long they were searching Keyes' car and in the trunk they found a ski mask along with other clothes that matched the description of the guy who was making withdrawals from these different ATMs. They also found a gun as well as Samantha's cell phone and debit card. After Keyes was arrested and was brought into custody, he denied having any involvement with Samantha's disappearance. But after being presented with the overwhelming evidence that suggested otherwise, he caved and said yes, he would tell them the full story of what happened to Samantha, but they had to get him an Americano coffee, a peanut butter Snickers, and a cigar. Once he had said items, he began to speak. And what he said was so disturbing and so graphic, the FBI still has not released the full transcript of his confession. Here is the version of events based on what was made public. On February 1st, 2012, Keyes decided he was going to rob the Common Grounds coffee kiosk. He walked up to the window, expecting there to be some teenager working inside, and he was right. It was Samantha. He asked her for an Americano, and while she turned to make his drink, suddenly his plan changed. Not only was he going to steal money from inside of this coffee shop, he decided he was going to steal Samantha from this coffee shop. When she turned back with his drink and handed it to him, he discreetly pulled his gun out and aimed it at her and told her this was a robbery. That's when she backed up and put her hands up, and then she turned around, he tied her hands, he jumped back inside, and then he said after he shut the window, he jammed napkins inside of her mouth so she couldn't make any sound, and then he marched her out the door, outside, into his car, and they took off. Once they were in the vehicle, he pulled the napkins out of her mouth, and he told her if she tried to escape, or if she tried to flag anybody down, that he would just kill her. 
And so he said she was very obedient. She was obviously very scared, but she was trying to do her best to stay composed. At some point, Keyes reached over and took her phone and sent that text message to her boyfriend, informing him that she was going to be spending a couple of days with friends and that he should tell her father. And then Keyes told Samantha he was going to be holding her hostage and trying to extract some ransom money. Samantha told Keyes that her family was very poor and that he wouldn't get much money out of them. To which Keyes said, don't worry about it. I know they'll raise money and they'll come up with it somehow. Then they drove around Anchorage for several hours, periodically stopping so Samantha could get out and relieve herself, other times so Keyes could smoke a cigar. Then around midnight, Keyes made his way back to his house and he pulled into the driveway and he turned to Samantha and he had her go in the back seat and lie down and he put some tarps over her and he told her if she tried to escape, he would kill her. And then Keyes got out and he walked inside of his house where his 10 year old daughter and his girlfriend were fast asleep. And in just a few hours, Keyes and his daughter were scheduled to go to New Orleans for a two week long luxury cruise. Keyes left his house and went back to his car. He put a blindfold on Samantha and then led her down the driveway to his shed. Once inside, he sat her down on an upturned bucket in the back of the shed. And then he put a rope around her neck and he anchored each end of the rope to the wall. So she was pinned to the wall. Then Keyes turned his radio all the way up to make sure it masked any noise she might make, even though he reminded her repeatedly that if she made any noise, he would just kill her. And by and large, she was very obedient. And then he gave her a couple of cigarettes to smoke and told her it was gonna be just fine to just chill out, that he was gonna get the ransom money from their family. And then as soon as that was done, he would let her go. He turned on some space heaters to keep the space warm. And then he left and locked the door. He walked back into his house and double checked that his daughter and his girlfriend were still asleep they were. Afterwards, he started drinking some wine and relaxing. And then after a little while, he got a cup of water and he went back out to the shed. He went inside and he gave the water to Samantha. And he said Samantha was very composed. She was obviously frightened, but she asked him, did you speak to my father? Did you figure out the ransom situation? And Keyes told her that, yes, I talked to your father. Everything's working out fine. He's going to raise the money. We're going to get you out of here. Everything's going exactly to plan. After that, he walked up to Samantha and he unscrewed the two anchors that were holding that rope up against her throat. And then he cut the zip ties on her wrist, allowing her to relax and sit forward and just kind of be at ease for a second. And it was very obvious that Samantha was relieved. Her nightmare was about to be over. But then seconds later, Keyes grabbed her really aggressively and tied her up all over again, this time much more thoroughly and much more tightly. It had been a cruel trick. When he cut her handcuffs and undid her necktie, he just wanted to see what she would do if she thought she was being let go. When in reality, he was never going to let her go. There was no ransom. He had not spoken to her father. It was all a big lie. Keyes told investigators that as he was tying her up for that second time, he looked at her face and she had this look of total resignation. He said she knew what was about to happen to her. After Keyes tied her up, he left the shed and locked it behind him. He went inside to check one more time to make sure his 10 year old daughter and his girlfriend were still asleep when they were. He went back to the shed. He opened it up. He went inside. And this time when he stepped inside, it smelled like urine and sweat. And he looked down at Samantha and she was terrified. He walked up to her and he began to assault her. And then after he was done, he was standing over her, getting his clothes back on. And Samantha very stoically looks up at him and says, are you going to kill me? And he says, yes, I am. As he put on his leather gloves, she tried to talk him out of it, but he said there was no other way. Keyes would tell investigators that he was very impressed with Samantha's bravery. Shortly before 4 a.m., Keyes drove a knife into Samantha's back before choking her until she stopped moving. He told investigators that she never made a sound. After she was dead, Keyes left the shed and locked it behind him. He went into his house, he took a shower. Afterwards, he woke up his daughter and told her to start getting ready because they were leaving soon for the airport. While his daughter was getting ready, Keyes went back out to the shed. He went inside. He rolled Samantha's body up in a tarp and pushed her towards the back. He unplugged the space heaters, turned off the lights, turned off the music, and then double locked the shed and went back inside the house to make his daughter breakfast. At 5 a.m., a cab showed up at the house and Keyes and his daughter hopped inside and they made their way to the airport and then on to New Orleans where they went on their two week long vacation. After they got back, Keyes went inside of his shed. He unrolled Samantha from her tarp and by his account, she still looked fairly lively. And so he dressed her in some new clothes. He put lots of makeup on her face. He braided her hair and then he stitched her eyelids open. So it gave the impression she was alive and alert. And then he held up a copy of the Anchorage Daily News next to her and then took several photos, creating that proof of life photo for the ransom note. If you want to see this photo, you can Google it, but that's up to you. After he took these pictures, he chopped her body up into pieces and then disposed of her in a nearby frozen lake. It would turn out Samantha was not Israel Keyes' first victim. 
He was in fact a serial killer who specifically preyed on completely random people because he enjoyed watching them die. Over the years, he had hid what he called kill kits all over the United States, which were these caches filled with weapons and other tools designed to capture and kill people. This way, no matter where he was in the country, when he had an urge to go kill someone, he would just go to his nearest kill kit, dig it up, and then go target a random stranger. And he didn't care if you were young, old, big, small, male, female, alone, or in a group. Everyone was a target of opportunity. Keyes told investigators that as soon as he saw Samantha inside of that coffee kiosk, instantly he knew he was going to kill her. Everything about the ransom, the robbery, all of it was just a lie to keep her in line, to give her some hope that she might get out of this alive. When in reality, the second she walked outside of the doors of that kiosk, she was dead. Keyes admitted to killing Samantha as well as an older couple up in Vermont, but he would take his own life in a jail cell in December of 2012 before he named any of his other victims. And so to this day, we have no idea how many people he killed. The best guess is 11 based on a drawing he made in his jail cell, but that's just a guess. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please replace the five star review buttons eye drops with Egyptian fox urine. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and everywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories I have posted on my YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on any major social media platform. My username on all of them is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my direct messages. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.